we're going to hear from a guest that's involved in a really unique project, giving voice to some of those founders. We welcome Adina Karpuch. Adina is a Chilean native who grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. I had the delight of actually teaching her in the eighth grade. After traveling the world for the year, she moved to Israel in 2015. She lives in Jerusalem, where she studied psychology, sociology, and anthropology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Adina is fascinated by narrative identities and the ways in which they determine how we understand, how we relate to the world. I think this deep interest and appreciation for storytelling is what brought her to her current work at Israel Story. And Adina will share more about that, how she became involved, and this unique and timely project that she's currently engaged in. Thank you, Mrs. Sassoon. So yes, just to tell you a little bit about myself, I grew up in Atlanta. I decided when I was 18 to do a gap year called Kivunim, which is based in Jerusalem, but you travel all over the world. And what I noticed during that gap year is that every time we landed back in Israel, I felt like I'd come back home. And so I determined that the only logical conclusion was to make it official and make this place my home. I made Aliyah right after that and joined the army. I finished my service. And when I was studying psychology, sociology, anthropology, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And an opportunity came about. I had been a lone soldier here. And so something that one does when they don't know anybody where they live, at least in this day and age, is listen to a lot of podcasts. You create these parasocial relationships, and it's really great uh, when you're trying to navigate a new place. And one of those podcasts was Israel Story. During the last semester of my degree, I decided to intern with the podcast. That internship turned into a job. And today I'm going to tell you all a little bit about uh, Israel Story and what we're working on right now, which has serendipitously become more and more relevant with time. Israel Story is the most listened to Israeli and Jewish podcast in the world. We have hundreds of thousands of listeners in more than 190 countries, but things weren't always this way. So as one does, I'm going to tell you a story. This is Mishi Harman. Back in 2010, Mishi, who was raised in Jerusalem, was finishing up his master's degree at Oxford. He was now thinking of where in the world he wanted to do his PhD, but his mother wasn't too happy about the prospects of him staying abroad, mostly because she wanted him to find a nice Jewish girl here at home in Israel. Mishi decided that he'd listen to his mother, and if he was going to leave the UK, he wanted to go out with a bang. And what did that mean? It meant taking a road trip across the U.S., and a good friend of his told him that he's he was probably going to get bored of music or audiobooks, and he gave him a set of discs. On the discs were a very popular show called This American Life. It tells slice of life stories, and Mishi loved it because it allowed him to traverse into all these different types of neighborhoods and lives that he otherwise wouldn't have met, and it felt like something Israel really, really needed. Why? Well, because two narratives generally exist about Israel. The cherry tomato narrative, Israel is the startup nation, Israel is full of innovation and high tech and advances in science and it can do no harm. Or the BDS narrative, occupation, apartheid, infringes on human rights, Israel can do no good. But there's a problem with those narratives, not because there isn't truth to both of them, but they're missing two primary things. The first is nuance. Israel can do both good and evil, just like any other country. And people. There are no people. There are no actual humans in those narratives. So Misha decided that through human interest stories, slice of life stories, stories about actual humans that live here, he might be able to change that. He got three of his childhood best friends together, and they decided to give it a go during their free time. There were two small issues. First of all, they had no clue what they were doing, no experience in radio, in recording, in editing, scoring music, or for that matter, interviewing and storytelling. And second, there was sort of a cultural hurdle that they had to overcome. At the time, and mostly still today, Israeli radio sounded something like this. 
לא ענית על שאלה אחת, ינון מגל, תודה רבה לך. אני אמשיך לגלית תעמולה. כן, לא, אתה. מה ההבדל בינך לבין היטלר, קרב אדום שכמוך? ואז תלך קיבינימט לארצות הברית, אתה והחברים שלך, פסטינקן הדרג גיי קיבינימטי, תעביר אותם מפה, לך לעזאזל. אני חושבת שזה היה חלק מהדברים It was going to be a hurdle for the Israeli public. But they figured they'd try it out anyway. So now they needed to find stories. They started around the dinner table. For example, Mishu remembered this one story his father had told him about something that had happened to him when he was 18. At the time, David, the father, was living in New York, and he decided to come back to Israel to enlist as a lone soldier. The story went something like this. And as we were walking, a car, a uh, pretty fancy car by the standards of those days, stopped and the window rolled down and an elderly lady poked out her head and said, Abe and David, what are you doing here? The elderly lady in question? It was Golda Meir, who was then the foreign minister, my father's boss, and an old-time family friend. Jerusalem was a small town in those days. A place where it made sense that you'd bump into the foreign minister and start chit-chatting. In any event, they told Golda they were looking for a room for my dad, who was about to go into the army. And she immediately said, stop looking. I live in a house a block and a half away from here, which is all empty, and it would be a pleasure if you just came and took a room there. And two days later, I moved in. Once they ran out of family members, they turned to friends, and from there to neighbors. They were all best childhood friends, so the pool wasn't very, very big. So neighbors came along pretty fast. After all, they wanted to tell extraordinary tales about everyday people, not tell tales about BB or Bennett or Iranian nuclear bombs or what you'll probably hear on Birthright. Pretty soon, stories were coming in from all over. Unknown stories about famous celebrities, about little known history, about the intimate small moments that make up a life, and about the huge unexpected twists and turns that do too. We've created four seasons in Hebrew, and now we're in our seventh in English. And now I want to tell you about a project we've been working on for the past few months. Before the elections and before the protests, Mishi, my boss, was sitting in his bathtub trying to figure out how the show would celebrate or mark Israel's 75th birthday. He started thinking about what happened on the day the country was declared 75 years ago. He thought specifically of this one moment. ערב שבת, ה' אייר תשחט ארבע עשר במאי אלף תשע מאות ארבעים ושמונה So for those who don't know, that's the moment the actual state was established and declared. And what you heard is David Ben-Gurion reading out Megillat Atzmaut, which is the Israeli Declaration of Independence. It's also the last time so many Jews agreed on one thing. So let's talk about Megillat Atzmaut. The story of Megillat Atzmaut is fascinating. It's full of compromises and really, truly, probably the most quintessential Israeli story one could imagine. The whole thing was written in three weeks. Instead of using the word for God, they chose a term that atheists interpreted as the people of Israel and religious folks interpreted as the creator of Israel. The word democracy doesn't even appear in the document, which according to one historian we interviewed is because it was so obvious no other form of governance would ever arise. So there was no reason to waste precious real estate on it. Compared to the American Declaration's 8,000 words, this one just has 664. And since the text is so short, every word counts. The word Jewish and Israel are mentioned a combined 45 times. The word right, schut, or privilege, is mentioned eight times. The word homeland, five times. God and democracy, we talked about those. There were actually disagreements about the sign text, although at the end, all 37 did sign. And talks of amending it the following Sunday, it was signed on a Friday morning, started immediately after the signature. But 
by that Sunday, war was ravaging and they couldn't reconvene to discuss it and they still haven't. Israel doesn't have, as I'm sure you know, a constitution, liberté, égalité, fraternité. It doesn't have anything but this one document. And so it's a pretty, pretty important one in our history. Okay, back to the bathtub. So Mishi's sitting there trying to figure out what Israel story should do for Israel's birthday. And really, if you think about it in terms of a country, Israel isn't 75 years old, it's 75 years young. So an idea occurred to him. Who were these people? Not who were they based on their Wikipedia pages, but who were they when they got home, took off their shoes, and propped their feet up on the couch? What funny, surprising, or juicy stories did they tell around the dinner table? What were their quirks and pet peeves? What did they want for the country back then? And what did they imagine its future would look like? Well, who better to answer all of those questions than each one of the 37's closest living relative? Over the past few months, our team has tracked down those 37 relatives. All but three live in Israel. Most of them lie between the center and the extreme left of the political map, though a few are right wing and some are ultra orthodox. Nine have sons or daughters that are alive. Most of the others have grandchildren and a few only have great grandchildren. And for the past few months, this is what our wall in the office has looked like, purposefully detective-esque. All of the black and white photos are the signatories themselves and the color photos are of the interviews, their relatives. We approached every interview with the same set of questions. They span from getting to know the signatory, who they were at home as mothers and fathers, at the podium versus behind closed doors. But we, of course, also asked them about what they would think the direction the country has gone in. What are its successes and what are its failures, points of pride and points of horror? What were their challenges back then and what would they think are the challenges today? Here is a taste of their answers. My father, I really saw him very little because he was imprisoned by the British, what they called Jewish terrorists. And my father signed this declaration. Declaration of Independence. Declaration of Independence. To sign it was a very exciting thing. I am the grandson of the person who signed tents in the Gilat Atzmaut. John Hancock on the Israeli Declaration of Independence in terms of size is Ben-Gurion's. But my grandfather's is the one that stands out most. My grandfather didn't marry women. Women married my grandfather. When I was coming home from school, he was there for me. We had five o'clock tea. When I played with my friends in the yard on Shabbos, I remember my father calling me to come up and study with him the Gemara, the Talmud. He had a beautiful tenor voice. He sang beautifully. My father looked at all our homework. He always looked at everything we did. We brought two ex back with him from the signing. And she said, this is the best thing that came out of the declaration. <laughs> you can see the roots of the fascism we are living today in this document. But I think he would have been very proud of the democratic character of Israel. My father thought that we will have to give back Judea and Samaria. But we were one of the early settlers. He never thought that we'd be in a situation like this. The religious people try to force the religion. We are dealing in lies. My father will be proud that Israel is Israel. I don't know if he would have been so happy with them. No, I don't think so. Our democracy is in trouble. Now that there is a right-wing government, I'm very happy. And if he was here, he will be ashamed. He would have been annoyed by the fact that in his neighborhood, Rahavia, there are so many Haredi Jews. The choice will be between losing the Jewish majority. The danger right now is very great. The country is beautiful. Or justifying the accusations that we're an apartheid state. The people of Israel are the shit. I'm sorry that I fought for a country that is not what he wanted. There is, I think, a self-hatred. Israel became now the state of apartheid. This is our country, and we have the right to be here like any other people in the world. My father is very happy to see the religious aspects of Israel today. It was a vision that went down the drain. 
Israel Story's new series, signed, sealed, delivered, is coming your way. The man who was laying the Megillat Tzmot, the text itself, is the son of Zorach Bar Haftig, which is one of the more well-known names and one of the more right-wing men in the group. He is religious and lived on a settlement for 40 years. And the man who said the land of Israel is beautiful, the people of Israel are shit, and that this is an apartheid state is the grandson and probably closest relative of David Ben-Gurion. So that's kind of just to place you in terms of who these people are and how differently they see modern Israel. And that's really a little taste of what they had to say, but there's so much more. Really all kinds of stories came out of this. I could tell you about the very astute Eliezer Kaplan, Minister of Treasury, who didn't like raisins and would pick them out of his chala at these very official dinners and put them in his pocket and save them for his granddaughter, Michal, who we interviewed. Or another woman whose grandfather, Nachum Nir, was on the way to the signing with the Megillah in his car when a cop stopped him for speeding. Now, the British had left and the new state hadn't yet been founded. So Nachum said, you better let me go. Because number one, you don't currently work for any government. And number two, you won't work for one if I can't go establish it. All kinds of stories like that. We also heard there from Yehudit Inbar, who lived in Jerusalem under siege when the state was established. So they flew her father out on a Piper plane to Tel Aviv. But his mother said, you better come back with some eggs because there are none to be found in Jerusalem. And indeed, he put two eggs in his pocket on the way home. And she said that was the best thing that ever came out of it. So those are some of the anecdotes. But of course, we also have some bigger takeaways. This is Megillat Atzma'ut at one of the protests. It really, in the past few months, has appeared everywhere on dining halls in Kibbutzim and on Kaplan Street and hanging off of skyscrapers in Tel Aviv. And there are bumper stickers everywhere that say, Nemanim le Megillat Atzma'ut, loyal to Megillat Atzma'ut. And just like you see in this picture, people are walking around, marching with it and saying, this is ours. So working on this project has really been a unique opportunity to step back and take stock during really an unusually pivotal moment in Israeli society. Over the course of several months of conversations with the descendants of the men and women who really, with the strike of a pen, gave birth to this country, we tried to understand who we were then, who we are now, and where we're going. And there's a lot to say about it, but I do have a few preliminary takeaways that I'd love to share with you and then open it up for discussion and questions. Number one. Megillat Atzmaut is hidden in plain view or both everywhere and nowhere. The, the declaration is perhaps the most ubiquitous document in Israel, especially these days, as I mentioned. It also is hidden from the public. I mean that both literally, it's really difficult to get to the National Archives and to agree for them to take it out of the vault. Two of our producers did that. And in the most Israeli fashion, after months and months and months of calling and badgering them and not giving up, they finally said, fine, you can come see it. Once they got in the nondescript building through the back door, they were handed the Megillah and asked to lug it around the entire building while they looked for an open room and left alone with it. <laughs> and also content wise, there are many widespread misconceptions surrounding the document. As we mentioned, chief among them, Medina Yehudit Vedemokratit, a Jewish and democratic country. People believe it originates from the Declaration of Independence, but it's not there yet. It doesn't show up. Second, God. The brilliant insight regarding the ambiguous term Tzur Israel has indeed withstood the test of time. Until today, much like in 1948, different segments of the population read their own ideologies into it. There's those that believe that Tzur Israel means God, Tzur Israel v'goalo, and there's others that believe Tzur Israel is the people of Israel, the might of Israel, the strength of the people. Megillat Atzmaut is a unifier and a divider. 
at the massive protests, and I'm sure you've all seen this in the news, many national symbols have been reclaimed on both sides, chief among them the flag and also the Megillah. And that raises interesting questions about ownership. Who does the declaration and by proxy the ideas expressed in it belong to? And how do both sides of this fierce political divide in Israel claim to be the direct ideological continuation of its tenets? No one is saying, away with the Megillat that's mode. Everyone is saying we're loyal to it and this is what it means. In interesting ways, it's both a departure from and a continuation of the debates surrounding the text back in 1948. While the Declaration of Independence, which, as I mentioned, was written over the course of three weeks and with no more than a handful of drafts, was a rare moment of unity and agreement, historical, cultural, legal, and to a certain extent, religious, it was also a source of much discord. As early as two days after the birth of the state on Sunday, many of the signers expressed discontent over what was included and what was omitted and wanted to meet again to reassess the whole thing. Number four, a young 75-year-old. It's often easy to forget how young a country Israel is. Unlike the US, for instance, where all the signatories of the American Declaration of Independence have long ago moved into the realm of historical figures, here there's a sense that we can still touch our founding fathers and mothers. We can still get a firsthand sense of who they were as people at home with their families. And that's exactly what we tried to do and I think also succeeded in doing with this project. Understanding that these people weren't just these political figures or historical maneuvers and shakers, they were real people, and there was a lot of friendship, but also discord among them. Fifth, there's also this impressionist or pointillism effect that comes from the Megillah. From afar, the signatories look pretty similar. They're mostly male, 35 of the 37 are male, almost entirely Ashkenazi. One is from Yemen, and the other one is Sephardi, and mostly between traditional and secular. But as you kind of take a closer look into their makeup, you find significant differences and variations between them. The work is made more beautiful the closer you are because it makes you appreciate it way more. The differences between these people and the compromises and the agreement that they were all able to make in the sake of this one miracle is really incredible. And lastly, the variation. We were really interested to see whether the variation between the signers grew or diminished 75 years out. At the outset, we really didn't know who these descendants would be or what they would believe, where they would live, how religious they would be, who they would vote for, etc. Would they think like their forebears, or had they forged their own, perhaps even opposite ideological paths? Did they live in Israel? And if not, why not? And we were curious to see if they'd be more or rather less representative of Israeli society than the original group of the signatories. Knowing what they know about Israel today, do they think that their fathers and mothers and grandparents have signed the declaration? And really, the Answers surprised us, but to find out those answers, I am going to make it hard, and you'll have to listen to the show. The whole uh, series is called Signed, Sealed, Delivered, um, and we are in the midst of releasing episodes about twice a week now. And that's that. It's fascinating to me because at CIE, we are constantly looking at history. We're looking at sources to understand nuance, and I'm not sure that I ever really thought that sound and that the voice can add something a little bit different. And is there something special that you think about voice that you can't even understand from the written word? Is there something even more unique about listening? In Israel, really, you look at someone for a tenth of a second and you already know who they're probably voting for. In the next elections, especially if you have a street address, if you know what synagogue they pray at, if they pray at a synagogue. And so I think that when you take all of that away, you can actually really just listen to what they have to say and, and maybe find commonalities and maybe not. But for the first time, you're really meeting people who are different than you. Within the context of this project, I can share a personal story where we had the descendant of a rabbi by the name of 
Meir Levin, who was a signatory. He came to our studio for an interview and I closed my eyes. I was sitting in the control room, so it wasn't weird. <laughs> and I closed my eyes and I really listened to what he had to say. And this man is brilliant in my mind. I really agreed with him on so many things. And he is a Haredi man from Nebrak with eight children. And our lives pretty much look completely different in the day to day. And I probably would have written him off, honestly, if I had kept my eyes open. But when you listen to people's voices, you're more open to showing them empathy. Pretty powerful message with regards to what's going on in Israel and anywhere, anyone in your life, Absolutely. especially for young people, but for everyone. Absolutely. And, and I'll say one more thing about it. In each episode, we include archival tape. And so we also hear tidbits of the signatories themselves. And some are talking about policy and others are talking about getting arrested by the British and funny stories that have to do with that or unexpected tales about that. And so I think that's also kind of a way to feel connected. What kind of reactions are you getting from Israelis? I mean, when we hear the grandson of David Ben-Gurion say quite a jarring claim about an apartheid state, how are people reacting to those comments on both sides? So it's interesting because we released David Ben-Gurion the day before we released uh, Zohar Bar Haftig, or rather his grandson and his son. And both days we got a ton of lashback. People were saying, this is hate speech. You are self-hating. How could you do this? What kind of show have you become? And it was totally about both episodes. I think that listening to people People share their views openly, makes people feel as though criticism of Israel is something that means you hate Israel. But when you ask Yeriv Ben Eliezer, David Ben Gurion's grandson, if he would ever move, he said, Mapitom, this is my home and I'm going to stay here fighting until mm. the day I die. And so to criticize Israel does not mean to not love it. I mean, I don't think you can argue that a man like that doesn't love. Do you have any message to young people, to teens? You know, in the beginning, you talked about the extremes, so the cherry tomato and the birthright story versus the BDS story. And I think teens, when they're on social media, all they really see and consume are the extremes. How do teens kind of look past that and understand the reality of what's going on, the nuance? I think it can be really, really hard because of social media, because of the echo chambers it puts us in. But I think if you can look beyond that, and if you can say, okay, you know what, I'm going to talk to an actual human who lives their day-to-day -day life here, and maybe they don't have something to say about the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, but they do have something to say about how they remember the price of tomatoes when they were little and how it's gone up and what has happened, or about the kibbutz they grew up on that no longer exists, or about their views on the conflict versus their relationship with their Palestinian grocer. I think you can start to complicate and to give nuance to those narratives. And I think at the end of the day, as much as Israel is probably one of the, the countries of the most experts and historians and people dealing with it outside of Israel, and, and I'm not saying that's not important at all. It's important to, to study it also academically, but also don't leave the people who are actually living the Israeli peer experience aside. I think they're just as important. This is a gold mine for Jewish ed. Do you have any ideas how teachers, educators can use this with their kids? So we're actually in the midst of developing a curriculum. I think Israel story is honestly something I was really missing in my Israel education. Israel wasn't coming to life, not through the textbooks and not through eating falafel because it's mm -hmm. Yom Atzma'ut. I think having students, for instance, with Science Seal delivered, each take a different episode and try to understand the viewpoint of the signatory and understand the historical context during which that signatory was living and what was influencing them. And of course, we have all kinds of people who fled the Holocaust and try to understand those influences, et cetera, and be able to even debate those viewpoints Role-playing becomes a little bit easier when you can hear so exactly. intimately the character of the individual. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm not an educator, and I really am amazed by those who are, but I agree that this is a goldmine, and we are really in the midst of developing something around that right now. 
any lasting thoughts about how you're feeling these days? The unrest that you see on the streets, has it changed anything about how you view Israel or your motivations for wanting to live there and, and be part of that story? This is me taking my producer hat off. <laughs> for me personally, it's been a really difficult time. I feel that this government is in many ways, the exact opposite of what I think Israel should be, could be, should look like mostly as it has to do with equal rights, and especially on the nationality level, Palestinian Israeli. And on the other hand, I will say I have felt more optimistic than ever, because I think a lot of countries might be apathetic to a kind of change like this, or, or if not apathetic, then at least not coming out on the streets week after week in the cold, in the rain, in the heat, whatever it is. If you had asked me before these protests started, what are Israelis going to do? I would say that they'd read the newspaper and cry and that would be it and things would go as planned. And they haven't. People are out on the streets. People are fired up. And that gives me a lot of hope about what kind of people we are, even if the government doesn't represent me yeah. at all. So in that sense, I do feel very heartened by what we're seeing. And again, it's the human story. It's not the political story, but it's the human story of the people yeah. who actually live here. And you can find the links to Israel's story on the Center for Israel Education's website right now. Thank you so much, Adina. It has been just beautiful to see you and doing this wonderful work. And it has been an inspiration really to so many. So thank you for joining us today.